Welcome to Rock, Paper, Hang Grenades. I am Gary Harper, the state rep from out west in Ware. And this Ware is... Ware out west? Right. right. This, is, this is the Honorable Eric Eastman. So pleased you joined us, just like we promised you, as we do every week. We haven't moved. We just ducked under the desk, maybe freshened up a bit, but here we yeah, are. Yeah, not that fresh. Just like we promised. Well, not you. Not, no, no. I try not to take showers because it... Um, I love the shades, by the way. Thanks. You feeling a lot of wind right now? A lot the, of wind. Doesn't it look like it? it? Yeah. yeah, it feels yeah. like it's. <laughs> it was a nice day for a motorcycle ride today. Yeah. I went up to the state house because um, Sir Al Baldessaro had a uh, information meeting for new state representatives, and he, and I went up there to see see mm -hmm. him and support you know what was going on. Because you remember Sir Al of Baldessaro, I Lynn. I do very well. He helped me kick in some doors. Oh, wait, knock kick, on kick some doors. On <laughs> some, knock on some doors, yes. Our, our guest today is the very distinguished and honorable Lynn Blankenbecker, who, having served in the House not once but twice, having won twice in a district that was very challenging to win, did so anyway, and having done so many other wonderful things in life. It's going to be a great hour. It's going to go by fast. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Sure. And mostly always a pleasure. Oh, Baby thank you for your service, young lady. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Because you Indeed. served three tour. You did no. You did Gulf War One. Yes. Two. Yes. And Afghanistan. Correct. Because we had you on the show a few years ago before you had to go uh, for your, for the uh, you went with the Navy to D.C. for a, a few years, right? Supposed to be two. Ended up being five and a half. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but she was on the show before that. She was, ta ta was. telling me some of the, the stuff that went on in uh, Afghanistan. It was pretty heart-wrenching stuff. Yeah, it was. It was. But but now, you, uh, now you're a retired captain or you're retiring? Not. No, I am not retired, nor am I retiring. I intend to stay in the reserve as long as they'll let me stay as in the reserves. It, what is, is there an age? For people like me with a critical wartime specialty, I can stay till I'm 68. So you got another 50 years before you have you. to. Boy, I love you, Gary. Right? <laughs> <laughs> He's good like that, isn't he? Oh, yeah. I know, I know. Well, well, yeah, that was. Yeah, I remember when you, you were on and you were talking about some of the uh, the kids. Uh, if I remember correctly, the they would um, kids would get hurt by say a, a American vehicle. You'd come in, patch them up. And then their parent, they were no good to the parents anymore, so they'd take them out and get rid of them. Yes. Well, there was a lot of really sad stuff. You know, I, I, I felt very badly for the children over there. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, it was a... Well, the thing is, is that actually leads into a political thing, because what the Americans were doing was, was honorable. They were trying to compensate people if something bad happened. But what it really did was encourage people to do bad things. Correct. You, in yes. other words, yeah. the, the, the United States government, not deliberately, but inadvertently, was paying for children to be harmed because parents, all they cared about was getting the, the money from the U.S. taxpayers. Right, right, right. No, it was, yeah, there was a lot of, I don't know if it was real, you know, we could categorize it as child abuse because we couldn't prove what happened, but, you know, Children fell off a horse or something like that, and they'd come up with an injury that wasn't compatible with an injury you would see falling off a horse. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for your service. Thank so you. now, what? Uh, so we haven't seen you since then. You've um, you were state rep in Concord for two terms, like mm -hmm. uh, Eric said. You were you were on. Uh, were you vice this your second term? You were vice chair of uh, state and federal relations and veterans affairs. My favorite Why favorite veteran, committee, having been on that committee. It's yes. a good committee. Isn't Why do it? veterans have so many affairs that you have to have a committee to talk about them? <laughs> it's the uniform, man. It's, a uniform. it's the uniform. <laughs> it, just, it does things to people. Good point. Good point. Man. Oh goodness! <laughs> it's going to get worse from here. Oh, okay. so, yeah. I didn't know I was coming on a comedy show. Oh, no, yeah. no, no. The I show? Sh I should have. I should have. Yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it only degrades from here. It, yes, it gets worse. It's yeah, Lynn was Lynn was with us. Our, um, I forget what term. Was, I think it was your second term when we went up to Canada. Oh my goodness! Wasn't that an adventure? Oh What's yeah, we went. We went up to. You got to go to Canada. Oh yeah. Yeah, the Canadian government paid for a busload of legislators oh, that's a to come up and, and talk about uh, Northern Pass and to... What and about hydropower? They Hy wanted to teach us about hydropower and what they were planning on doing to our state. Yes. So 
and how much surplus the they had. Oh That's my gosh, do you remember when the bus this. went backwards down the hill? Holy smokes. Yes. We were, it was just snowing, and we're going up through the North Country trying to get to uh, to Canada, and we were on this little road. There was nowhere, I mean, barely had Nothing. to pass. And it was going up a hill, and we, had a, we were in a chartered bus. What, was it a bipartisan <laughs> yes, mix of people? it was okay. bipartisan. Okay. And um, the bus started <laughs> sliding down the hill. So then it actually started sliding and turning, right? A little so bit, then, yeah. So then the bus driver was like, everybody go sit on the other side of the bus to get it to turn back. Yeah, everybody had to get, you had this whole, the whole bus flow to legislators, and the bus driver says, everybody get up and go and stand on the back wheel. Oh, that's right. Right? <laughs> That's right, folks. You've heard oh that goodness. New Hampshire's, you know, politics are a little strange, a little idiosyncratic. Here's proof. This is how we do international relations. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think I think the Canadian ambassador was pretty embarrassed about how bad this went. It went really, really bad. It was like smoke coming up because he's like burning rubber trying to get up the. Oh, it was. It was <laughs> horrible. Well, and I was there, and there were some representatives who were quite frightened that we yeah. were going to go tumbling down. And the other, oh, the cool thing too was that, that we only had a few Democrats because it's Republican controlled. Right. And uh, one of them says, "Oh, now we know why they brought us." <laughs> <laughs> that in was cases, my first thought was cases, if it was all Republicans in, in the place no, of the thing. In case rigged. it resorts to cannibalism, they can start with us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They'll make a movie, you'll yeah. be famous. I know, exactly. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was a very interesting trip to say that. It was, it was. They tried to sell you a Northern Pass. Well, the, how yeah. that turned out. Then the guy from Hydro Quebec, he's uh, 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 Bill O'Brien, told me that he was in a $5,000 suit or something, which I don't know. I don't know about suits. Uh, and. Uh, we just, we tortured that guy. He ended up getting, I think he got fired after that. Oh, did he? Because he didn't have any answers. He looked good. Well. He was dressed well. My concern was, you know, what were these towers going to look like all over the North Country? Sure. And, uh, you know, we asked, do you have an alternative? No. And then I said, show us a picture of the towers. He kept saying, ah, oh, the towers aren't so bad. They're very picturesque. Yeah, they're 200 <laughs> feet, which is twice said, the size of most trees. Right. I said, well, show me a tower. Can you give a picture? Oh, no, they didn't have any pictures no, to no, show no. us of the towers of what they were going to look like. But they assured us that it was not going to affect the aesthetics oh, of the no, North Country. No. Yeah. Oh, here's a good one, though, is, is I had always... I had always nor, nor with the high voltage effect. No, no, it won't hurt anybody. No. What I um, really suspected for a long time, because you always hear about people ending up with cancer along power lines. So I asked him the thing that always... I was suspicious of, which was that maybe it's not the power line at all, it's the defoliants they use to control the undergrowth, right? right so right. I, I asked him, what do you, you know, what do you use? And he said, um, I, he said a very, he had a very, very measured answer was that, um, well, we're not allowed to use defoliants in Canada, okay? Which he didn't say we weren't going to use when we in go the through United the United States, <laughs> right? Nice dodge. It was right, a great right, dodge. Right. That's a great dodge. And if you weren't paying attention, it probably could have worked. <laughs> or we could have used goats. Goats are good defoliants. Goats are good, yeah. yeah. Goats on, on scissor lifts. <laughs> get the leaves. And yeah, that, that, was, that was really cool because the Canadian government paid for the whole thing. They paid for a really nice dinner. We had a very nice dinner. Very time. nice dinner. and It was, it a, was near a casino. People were... were Taking part of it, the casinos. So oh, it was, was cold. That was though. planned. It was very cold. Yeah. <laughs> it was very cold. Wow. Yeah. You don't you don't plan that trip in February. No. I, I don't know what they were thinking. They were going to show us hydroelectricity in, in Quebec yeah, in February, but. But it was very uh, pretty cool. Pretty interesting. It was cool. Doesn't yeah, sound like it a was really well planned uh, campaign. No, on their no, part, they then. they didn't do too good. The Canadian government. Did not impress us that much. <laughs> well, they didn't get their northern pass. No, they haven't. You know. They haven't quit yet, though. There's got to be other safe anyway, ways to get that energy here, I'm sure. So, Lynn, what motivated you to run for Congress? I think, uh, by the way, I think you're an awesome candidate. Cause oh, I, thank you. Because I, I know, I've known you in the House, and I know that you're a conservative, and I know that you're honorable, and you've always, always been honorable, your behavior and your votes, and... And it'd be a pleasure to have you in the federal government, but why would you put yourself through this? Well, what, where, where, what's going on inside of Lynn Brain? <laughs> well, thanks for the thanks for the vote of confidence. You know, after my five years at the Pentagon and the Defense Health Headquarters, 
keep in mind, I was asked to go to the Pentagon back in 2012 because of my recent deployment experience. I was asked to do health care policy there, so they wanted, and of course it was for the Navy, mm -hmm. so uh, somebody who had been recently deployed, somebody who had legislative experience, of course I had that, somebody who had legal experience who could sift through Title X. Oh yeah, I um, forgot you're a lawyer too. I'm a lawyer, and somebody with health care experience. So I was pretty much the only person in the inventory that they were going to be able to pull back to the Pentagon to do this. And so when I got there, what I discovered was we were trying to manage health care under the Obama administration. And so we had, what do we have? We had the Affordable Care Act. We had transgenders in the military. We had the National Defense Authorization Act, which Section 700, the 700 series of that, deals with health care delivery in the military. So there were a lot of things going on. We had the Veterans Administration and how we were going to integrate the disability evaluation system. Lots going on. It's a full plate. <coughs> Excuse me, from a healthcare perspective. So I stayed. They kept me through that third year, which put me through 2015. And then what do we have coming up in 16? Another election. Yeah. And so we elected a different president who promptly repealed the Affordable Care Act, repealed <laughs> transgenders in the military. And now we had to go back and, and figure out that policy and what we were going to do with all of that. Um, in the meanwhile, the 2017 National Defense Authorization Act came out. Uh, fundamentally changed military medicine and the way we were going to deliver medicine. We also were compelled to have, under the Obama administration, a universal electronic health record. So then the military purchased a very large health record, and so we had to figure out how we were going to implement that mm -hmm. and the policies that went around that. So I was a very busy woman there, but it was during that time that I got a front row seat to what was going on in Congress, because remember, I had to answer all the RFIs, the requests for information back to Congress. And I worked with the Office of Legislative Affairs all the time. Yeah. And this continual bickering and the infighting and the gridlock that was happening. I don't know if you know this. <coughs> Excuse me, I've recently had a cold. Um, in the Pentagon, 60% of the people there are civilians and 40% are military. And they do that by design so that when the military people turn over every two or three years, you have this base of institutional knowledge. Well, every time there's a government shutdown, a sequestration, a furlough, whatever you want to call it, the civilians have to go home. So imagine if you had to, if you had to take 60 percent of your workforce away and they couldn't come to work or, or contribute. It nearly crippled us in the Pentagon. Right. And think about what happens at the Pentagon. <laughs> Right? Right, and we, right. Oh, let me think about this. We're still a nation at war, and we have big issues with the Pentagon, and we had all this health care stuff going on, and we had, you know, old airplanes, and we have old ships, and how are we going to modernize those or get new ones and get them up to speed? And, ooh, we got a little kerfuffle going on out in the Pacific Theater we might want to pay attention to, and uh, we still got all the nonsense going on. And then what happened right after President Trump became president? Ooh, Syria decided to start their nonsense with their chemical weapons. So there was a lot going on. We can't afford to continue to lose 60% of our workforce. Right. And I just looked at this dysfunction and watched it chip away at our national security, and I thought, you know what? I have a health care background. We've got a health care concern in this, this yeah, country. Yeah, we forgot to mention you're a nurse. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. For you the know, Navy. I've got a legal background, a legislative background. I certainly have a 32-year military career and, and counting. Um, been out on the front lines. So you, were, you joined the military when you were three. God bless you. I love you. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, you're I'm, I'm making points tonight. You I'll are making points. One day, <laughs> one day I may get to wear sunglasses just I know. Like <laughs> I know. Someday, but not this day. So it was that, that's what motivated me to run. I, I really felt like that, if not me, then who? Somebody's right. got to step up. And sure. in the meanwhile, everybody knew I was getting ready to come home. People started calling me from New Hampshire and saying, Lynn, you got to fix this. We don't have any representation in this state. Right. And uh, please come home. We we need a representative like you. Yeah, we got one. We, we got one congresswoman who has her history is in lobbying for the drug companies. There you go. Uh, huh. Oh, and we got an opioid crisis in our state. Oh, well, what a coincidence! <laughs> yeah. I wonder if so, there's any conflict there. Uh, no, no, no. There couldn't possibly be. So I think you know. When you look at our delegation we have right now, we have two senators who are both very liberal, progressive, you know, Democrats. 
we have two congresswomen who are likewise. Um, for those of us who are conservative Republicans, we have no representation in Congress. And I think that, um, if nothing else, now's our opportunity to win maybe one or two, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, seats back, but um, that we can possibly win those seats back. And uh, at least for the conservatives in the state, we can have some representation in Congress. I'm very saddened and very disheartened. Um, I read somewhere uh, that our, my representative, Ms. Custer, our representative Custer, was quoted as saying, I voted with Obama 99% of the time. Right. But one thing I have never seen is a quote that said, I voted for New Hampshire just once, or voted with New Hampshire just once. Right. That's really but sad. No. Should, that should be the focus, not... You should never vote for your party. You should always be voting for your district. Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. As, a leg as a state legislator, you kind of <coughs> get that. You only have two obligations, really. One is to vote with the Constitution first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And then your constituents. All right. The party is nice, but they don't vote for you. No. You no, know? and you know, I think that the job is called representative, and you should represent. You should represent the interests of your state, and you should do what's right in every instance for your state. Yeah, it's a true statement. So. It's a true statement. A lot of a lot of we uh, state representatives were concerned about another energy import scheme that failed also, and that was called uh, the Kinder Morgan Pipeline. And I'll tell you, we tried to get the attention of, of our uh, congressional representative. We tried to get some kind of a statement. We tried to get some participation. And, uh, you know, party lines notwithstanding, the fact mm -hmm. is the many, many, many citizens along the southern corridor of CD2, mm -hmm. of Congressional District 2, were up in arms about this plan. And they really felt it was being shoved down their throats and that imminent domain was being abused and they were they were feeling threatened and overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And their congressperson just was nowhere to be seen and, and nowhere to be heard. And those of us that stepped up to try to help could see that plain mm -hmm. as day. Yeah. So that's why so I decided to run. So that's why you decided to run. Because I want to bring some c civility to Congress. We have got to stop. You know, I'm in the military. I've been in the military for a long time, as we've already established. Mm. And it doesn't matter what uniform we wear, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard. It doesn't matter the color of our skin, whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter your religious background, your political background. At the end of the day, all of us come together and do one thing, and that's protect and defend this country and our Constitution. And if a million people in a uniform can do it, 435 people in Congress sure can do it. Yeah. And that's the ethos I intend to bring with me to Congress. I, I hope so, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's just getting so toxic. It is. It's very toxic. Look at these resistance movements that are going on. It's just resist. It's mm. not even let's get along or let's try to figure this out. It's n pure and simple let's resist. We're going to you know, stand, you know, draw our firm line in the stand and stand there. And they don't even vote anymore for... They vote against stuff. I'm going to vote against Trump. Mm. I'm going to vote against whatever. They don't even vote for something. Oh, oh speaking of for something, um, New Hampshire, your, your constituency, has a huge drug problem. Mm -hmm. A lot of those drugs are making their way over that southern border. Mm -hmm. What is your position on the wall? I think um, whether we build a literal wall whether we build a figurative wall or we have some combination of that, we have got to secure our borders. They are porous, you know, and I think that there are, are there are places along the border that lend itself well to a physical wall. I think there are places that lend itself well to electronic walling. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I think our president did a phenomenal job mobilizing the National Guard and getting them down there. That's exactly what the National Guard is designed to do, protect our borders right. and our nation. And so he's utilizing the National Guard in the right way. Um, and uh, I think that we will get those bo the border secured, but I think we've got to use a combination. Yeah, because some, some of the problem, I don't, I'm not sure how many people understand, is that the people coming from, first of all, the people coming from, from the South who are seeking um, asylum. Asylum, as far as I know, goes that if somebody needs asylum, the first place they go is the first border they cross. Mm -hmm. So if they're seeking asylum, it's supposed to be in Mexico, not in the United States, if they're coming from El Salvador or wherever. Mm -hmm. 
That's first. Second, the drug, the people who are selling drugs, I mean, you look at MS-13, who, who the president called animals, which is accurate. Mm -hmm. They behead people, they kill people, they traffic in people. These type of people, I mean, not, um, not, not to uh, make the assertion that all the people that are trying to come over the border are MS-13 types. Sure. Thank but you, you for making need, that distinction, Gary. But you only need a small percentage of them to be a, an absolute and in, uh, danger to the United States of America. And there's a percentage of them that are actually using children. They're, they're, they're trafficking and young children as part of their means by which to get into the United States. Mm -hmm. In other words, just because somebody comes across a border with a small child, it doesn't mean it's theirs. Right, right. And the idea that we're supposed to just, you know, accept all these, it's all about the children, is BS. Well, trust me. And, you know, I, 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 I feel horrible for the children. And yeah. I absolutely, you know, I don't want to see any families torn apart by any stretch of the imagination. But you hit the nail right on the head. If we start letting these this this free movement of children across the border like that without even without even identifying if that is their biological parent or their rightful parent or not that completely opens the door to human trafficking and oh my gosh do we want to be the nation to be known for you know potentiating and, and uh, this this trafficking of children like this this is crazy so you're you're absolutely right it, it, we Every time the babies come into the picture, you know, it, it starts to tug at the heartstrings. But we really have to make sure we have an obligation and a duty to protect those children and make sure that they're with the right people. And letting them come in across the border with people we don't know who they are is crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been an ins insane proposition that we're just supposed to open the borders and let because the Democrats, the Republicans, to their credit, tried a few different. Uh, pieces of legislation to try to fix the border. And I think at first they were going to let 700,000 dreamers in. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats said, OK. And then they started getting the bill together. And then they said, no, no, we're not. Schumer and the rest said, no, we're not doing that. So they upped the ante to 15, uh, 150,000. And they still said no. Because what, what they care about, I don't think they, I think in part they care about, um, I don't think they care about the kids at all. I don't even think that's even a variable. But what they really want to do is use the pictures of little children being separated from their parents at the border um, come November. They mm -hmm. just want those pictures all over the place. And that's what it's all about. It's all politics. And nobody but, cares about the border, the security of the country, right. the drugs that are coming into the country, or anything else. They care about politics. Yeah. No, and, and it's sad that they make children, put children at the forefront of politics. I mean, sadly, these parents that came over illegally with their children are the ones who victimized their children. They should have known that they were going to get caught illegally in this country and that they were going to have to go back. And so, But nobody's said anything about the parents who did this knowingly and have victimized their own children. That, to me, is where the outrage should be. Hey, Lynn, can I ask you something? If um, a New Hampshire woman is caught with an ounce of cocaine and she's got two kids with her, is she arrested? Or do they just let her go with her children? Or is she separated from the children? Well, I would... I, I would say that if somebody commits a felony and they're going to go to jail, they're going to send you to jail whether you have children or not. Right. So <laughs> separating children from parents because somebody has committed a crime is pretty typical. Mm -hmm. But nobody cares about that. those kids. Nobody said it, anything when my daughter was left behind when I went to the war. No, they didn't. Mm -hmm. How is she doing, by the way? She's awesome. She's a, an attorney now. Oh. Yes. No kidding. So she, Apple yes, doesn't she, fall far from the tree. She graduated from law school last year, and yeah. now she is a, an attorney in Texas and would love to come home. She's going to be sitting in the New Hampshire bar in February, and right. hopefully will come home and be a New Hampshire attorney at some point. Well, she's not Irish then. No. No, because no, then she, she no, Irishmen can never pass a bar. Oh. <laughs> You would just land and wait for that one. <laughs> <laughs>
There you go. But she does have an Irish name. Oh, okay. So that's cool. But yeah, yeah you're right. It, it, parents leave their children all the time to, to serve in our military, and, and I don't hear the Democrats complaining about that. No. Well, you know, to be fair, I don't think everybody on the left necessarily feels that way, nor is everybody necessarily obsessed with propagandizing at the no. expense of these children. You are correct. Broad sweeping statements like that may not necessarily be, be entirely well, correct. So, so for me, I, I think the way I see this whole issue is we now have an administration that has decided to enforce laws. These mm -hmm. laws have been on the books for years. These are not new laws that were created to victimize children. These were laws that have been on the books for years. We have a problem in this country. We have a drug problem in this country. We have a, you know, a gang problem in this country. We have, we have a problem in this country. And I think our president just started enforcing the laws. And unfortunately, you know, the, the parents who chose to bring their children over here now have to figure out how they're going to get them back home. Here's another, here's another variable that I don't ever hear anybody talking about as far as uh, the border, is that uh, the United States is better off than European countries, but still not great because the... Um, um, In terms of what? Um, the replacement birth rate is not good enough to, re to maintain okay. society. In other words, you have to have X number of children, young, young families and children, to maintain the growth of the population <coughs> so that um, guys like me who are old and getting decrepit have somebody to support us mm -hmm. because that's what, how the system works. And the United States is not at a replacement number. So actually, having people come from, uh, young families come from South America is really is not a bad idea. It's actually a very good idea if they were done, it was done legally. Mm -hmm. Right, and if they were taxpayers. Yeah, well, that's just it. You get young, <laughs> you don't, you don't have them come into the country and then start, you know, apply for Social Security, Medicare, and all. So right, that's right. that's just insane. Right. But if they were coming here to work, so they there were jobs. That's actually a really good thing for the United States because. The second thing is that they're culturally not diff very different. They're all it's mostly Catholic, mm -hmm. um, uh, so there's there's a, a still a cultural unity sure. that would be maintained. So there's actually not a bad thing to allow a lot more people to immigrate from South America to the United States or from anywhere. It's a long-standing American <laughs> tradition. But but to do it legally is the is the right. Yeah, my grandparents all came from you know overseas. My grandmother and my grandfather were from Germany and mm -hmm. and. Um, Denmark. And, um, you know, when they came over to this country, my mother was born first generation in this country. And my mother only spoke English. My grandmother learned English. She didn't even speak English when she came to this country. But my, hmm. my grandparents immigrated legally. They came over. They had my daughter, my mother. My mother served in World War II. My father served in World War II. He was a Marine. My mother was a nurse. And, um, and then, you know, they had a family of their own. And I think that that's the beauty of our nation. That's what makes our nation so great, mm -hmm. is that we are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a, a nation of laws. And there is a way to come over. If the immigration system is broken, by all means, we need to fix that. Yep. We absolutely need to look at that. You know, our, na our nation uh, is, is proud of its, you know, American and then add something onto the internet, whether it's Italian-American, yeah. Franco-American, sure. African-American, whatever that culture is, we're proud of that. And the diversity does bring a, a, a great, you know, it's what makes America so um, wonderful. But we're a nation of laws, and they need to come over here legal. Well, actually, there's something more important than, <coughs> than the, the diversity of the people. A lot more important. It's the diversity of the food. Mm. <laughs> Right? <laughs> so you get like Mexican foods, Italian food, Dunkin' Donuts. Fast food. Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's the important stuff. There right? you go. It really yeah. is. Okay. Second Amendment. Yes. I have a Second Amendment coalition. You want to join it? I would like to join that. Oh, we'd love to have you on our Second Amendment coalition. Mark uh, Vincent is uh, the chair of our Second Amendment coalition. Okay, okay. I'm going to ask this because this is to me more important. I think a lot of people, uh, people running for Congress, will ask what you think about the Second Amendment, and they always say, "Well, I went hunting when I was little." 
And it was like, yeah, so what's that have to do with the Second It doesn't have anything to do with the Second Amendment. You can regulate hunting all day long. Why do you believe in the Second Amendment and how important is it? Well, because the Second Amendment has two parts. Okay. The first part of the Second Amendment is to that we can protect ourselves against government tyranny. Right. And the second part says, and you can use guns to do it, <laughs> right? You can bear arms, right? Right, right. And so I think our founding fathers were very smart when they put that amendment in. They realized that we were going to have to be able to stand up against our government potentially and uh, protect ourselves. And they wanted this country to stay free. And that's the way they just, you know, one of the ways that they were going to ensure that freedom is for us to be able to, um, I, I love the design of our, of our, of our country. No military person or civilian person runs this nation or government. And this, you know, it's sort of run by a group. Right. And I love that, that they have the different inputs. But we've gotten away from that a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> you know, you look like the, look at the Navy or the Air Force or the Army. We have the Secretary of the Navy, who's a civilian. And then we have the Chief of Naval Operations, who's military or government. Right, right. right. But um, I think that, um, <coughs> excuse me, the Second Amendment... You're exactly right. I think a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm supposed to have the Second Amendment so I can go hunting, and that's not what it's all about. It does right. provide you the right to have your gun so that you can hunt if you wish, but it really is about protecting yourself against government tyranny. It really is, mm -hmm. because it's, it's all about balance of power. If the government has all the guns, they have all the power, and therefore right. you're their subject. If the people have all the guns, the government is our subject. Well, and then, you know, you look further with the Second Amendment and, um, you know, not only does does it give us that ability, but I think it empowers us. You know, it may, the, the Second Amendment is a very powerful amendment that, uh, that, that says to us, this is our country. We are we the people. And, 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 and I think it, it really sends that message. So the Second Amendment is really important to me. Excellent. That was a good, that was a good response. She gets an A plus from Gary. To Gary, <laughs> my, let's see what I means. knew those responses would be. Yes, yes. I knew that would be the case. Uh, we talked about borders a moment ago, and uh, I'm just curious: Do you or anybody that you think <coughs> is uh, running for Congress or running for re-election uh, feel the least bit concerned about security of our northern borders? Now I know it's not a big issue; it doesn't get a lot of press, a lot of airtime. Uh, but hey, we've got borders on both ends. And yes, we do. We're one of those states that does border. We're you know? a border state. We do. We are a border state. So. And I always say that, you know, um, we we have some serious concerns. You know, drugs do come in from Canada. People mm -hmm. are buying their drugs and, and getting, you know, you can get things shipped coming over, board, over the border. And I don't know if you've noticed, and I'm not suggesting we build a wall with Canada. Okay. But I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot of open free range you know the deer come across uh -huh. it's we, you know yeah we should stop the deer from coming across <laughs> they could be terrorists <laughs> they could be you don't know they look fluffy and everything but you don't know see that's how they I don't do know. it they got deer ticks and lime <laughs> that's see that's how it starts that's, that's how it, yeah <laughs> well actually that's you say this that that's true but they also um uh my friend tommy uh, lives up has a house up in in, in um what the heck, Pittsburgh? He was taking me to his camp. He's got he's got his house, and then he's got his camp way off in the sticks, and you can see across uh, across into Canada. He says that those those are all electronically monitored. Mm -hmm. So there's actually quite a bit of monitoring that goes on. Like if somebody crosses over, if a human crosses over uh, in the woods from Canada to the United States, they pretty well know about it. Right. It's yeah, not. Yeah. It looks open. Mm -hmm. But it isn't. So it's it is monitored, but it's just not as it's uh, the difference. I think is you can have monitoring station on the Mexican border, but if you know a thousand people cross at once, you don't have any control. Mm -hmm. But they've caught they've actually caught people terrorists coming over the Canadian border. So it is it is seen as a security risk or is not? Who? What? What? The northern border. The northern Is, border? Yeah, I, I think just, it could I'm just be. Curious. I mean, I think it could be. And I think that, you know, the, the immigration policies and the border control policies don't just apply to the, you know, to the Mexican border right. in Texas, right? It, it, it applies to all borders that we have. And so I think that um, whatever policy we, we put into place should be sound for both, you know, both, both directions. We do border other nations. 
there it is. That makes perfect sense to me. Me too. Me too. What, what else? Where else we can talk about? Uh, I'm just terribly impressed with the <laughs> with the extent to which you have familiarity with the way the the machine works in the Beltway. You know, the sausage factory. You hear right. all those metaphors. <coughs> um, and I don't know of any other. Certainly, no incumbents from New Hampshire, and I don't know of any other candidates in New Hampshire, of which there are many, as we both know in both districts. Oh gosh, districts. what are there? Twenty-five now. There's so many, I can't name them. Twenty-four, twenty-three. <laughs> I know there's a lot. Yeah, um, that have your familiarity with the the big word here, machinations, the way things actually work, the mm -hmm. way the gears turn. Yeah. In the Beltway, so that part speaks to me a lot. I was I was also on Veterans Affairs and learned a ton during a two year period. Sure. You were a co chair there. So that part of your of your uh, array of qualifications I find to be very compelling. Oh um, thanks, yeah. Because you need somebody that's got relationships, that understands the, the mechanisms and is able to uh, is able to use that knowledge to form a plan. Sure. from day one. Oh yeah and I'm glad you brought that up that I have relationships already forged so I've been endorsed by a number of organizations and one of the organizations mm -hmm. I've been endorsed by is the War Veterans Fund and I'm really proud of that endorsement. They looked at candidates who are who you had to have served in either Iraq or Afghanistan and they brought us together they picked four of us we have a, a female pilot from the Air Force mm -hmm. we have a Green Beret we have a Navy SEAL and me and so I feel like we've come together now in Dallas in Miami and in DC so I've met them we've worked together we've done stuff together so I already have a little coalition when I go in there's four of us so I have reinforcements and the way I look at it I got coverage from the air I got coverage on the ground I got the special <laughs> forces <laughs> and they got the nurse to clean it all up when it's all over right? right so we're ready to go we have this great little coalition we've already meshed well so for me just like you said when I get to DC all of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is already met. I know where the Coke machines are. I know where the bathrooms are. I've got these buddies, these battle buddies who are going to come in with me. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go in there and kind of start working on chipping away at the culture. Do I think we're going to change the culture overnight? Nope. But what we are going to do is plant the seeds. And we're going to get the momentum going. You know, we're a bunch of mission-oriented people. We're in the military. And the military is all about missions. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the oath you take as a congressperson is, you know, for all intents and purposes, the exact same oath we take when we raise our hand to def protect and defend this country and the Constitution. So it's the same oath, different mission. It's exactly what we're used to in the military. We're good at that. And so I think when we come in our first two years, you know, we're going to start planting those seeds. We're going to start changing the culture. We're just going to start bringing people around. Our second two years, we're going to get all the work done. And then most of us want to either punch after the second or third term. None of us want to stay for a career you know it's punch and get out we know where the eject button is on those airplanes and we know when it's time to bail out <laughs> and we we know you know we're smart people so I think bringing all that to Congress you'll see a gradual change but I think you'll be impressed with it <laughs> I, I hope so because it is it is extremely broken um, it was neat to hear that you would you would self-impose term limit um, just on a common sense basis I've been away from my family for 32 years off and on yeah. I do not want intend to spend the rest of my life away from my family. You know, uh, my family has sacrificed a lot and took a big hit with my deployments and mm -hmm. you know the, the shenanigans of being in the military for so long. Um, it has not been easy on my family, and my family deserves better than that. And when we're done, we're done. Um, you know, I plan to stay till I'm sixty. <laughs> I thought you said only a few terms. Yeah, it's a few See? terms. There you go. Look at you. You're just nailed it again. It's a few terms. You're getting there. Yeah, no. It'll take a lot more uh, terms than that. Yes, Man, you're quick. Uh, oh my gosh, that's so, awesome. So you know, I've also been endorsed by With Honor, which is an organization that started looking at candidates who they thought could bring this civility, and I'm very proud of that endorsement. Um, they're they're counting on us. They're banking on us. And there's other, there are other folks that have been endorsed by With Honor. So again. I have my War Veterans Fund, I have my MAVPAC people, and I also have my With Honor folks. And we're all singing from the same sheet of music. There's almost this no labels movement going on right now. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to get one of them up on the <coughs> show sometime. I'm familiar with, with the no guys. labels? Yeah, and yeah, And the, yeah. um, the Problem Solving Caucus. There's actually going to present, you know, they're gonna uh, uh, f stand up or formulate, I, I use Navy terms, so sometimes I stumble over my, my speaking, um, but we're gonna stand up a, pro they are gonna stand up a problem solving caucus. 
and just give well, say, yeah, a lot of this just nonpartisan or bipartisan. <coughs> exactly. Let, let's deal with issues constructively. You, you look at the border problem. It's really easy to fix. I mean, it's not. I mean, technically, there's issues, but legislatively, it's very simple to say yes. We're going to build a, a wall where where it's applicable, and electronic wall where it's not. You know, the, the mm -hmm. mechanical wall would be dumb, and we're going to secure the border and and we're and not allow constant flow of illegal immigrants in. I think most Americans want that, but it's it's. I think the real, the bigger problem is that there's no money in that. Mm -hmm. There's no money in solutions as long as they get this. No, of course not. Th as long as they've got this conflict, they've got people, you know, sending money in to try to re uh, pr protect their point of view. Mm -hmm. Well, but I would like to see some campaign finance reform. I'd like to see something to do with term limits. Uh, I, I saw that somebody, and I, I wish I could remember who it was now, introduced a bill that um, you, you only make one dollar after your third term. Bring that mic a little closer <coughs> to yourself, would you? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that you only, um, I got too comfortable here, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> casual. <laughs> um, that you only get um, one dollar after your third term. So talk about, you know, self-imposed term limits. You well, know. Only one dollar in compensation. You're, one dollar in compensation, pay. yes. That's an interesting. Thing. That is a, a, did it did it become an LSR? I, I have not LSR, I have not followed it very closely. I've been a little bit preoccupied with other activities yeah. of late. That's interesting. Um, but yes, I did hear that bill was either going to be introduced or was introduced. That's a really, or or if it if it's a uh, um, dimi uh, uh, continued diminishing returns, i.e. You get s your base salary, then the next term you get a little bit less, a little bit less, till after about four or five terms you're only so making. You can encourage folks to, yeah. Yeah, because because that's actually to me one of the bigger biggest problems I've seen in Washington D.C. is there people get there, they get on really good committees that have a lot of sway as to what taxpayer money goes where, and the next thing you know you've got you've got somebody who was worth a quarter of a million dollars before they went to Congress and now they're worth five or six million dollars in Congress so, so wouldn't dropping their pay on a graduated basis just encourage them to do the K Street shuffle that much more ambitiously you know and, and get yeah that's the other problem relationships yeah the, yes. obvious and, and all the pay explain to the viewers it. what the K Street shuffle well, is. K Street is a term that's used in the, in the Washington Beltway to refer to where most of the lobbyists hang out have their offices and and make their plans and do their work so it's a, it's a sort of a catch-all term for um, <laughs> the, the fourth or, or fifth branch of government these days which is the lobbyists yeah, right. you know yeah. So that's that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's been people that have been worked really hard on uh, um, the laws for. Uh, I was watching a thing on on writing the laws for medication, to actually, so that uh, the drug companies couldn't be held accountable for a lot of the things they were doing. And there was congressmen that got that through and worked on it, and they worked on, or they worked on it as a as a, uh, leg a legislative office person, mm -hmm. really really hard, got it through. And as soon as it got through, next thing you know, they're a, a vice president of, you know, Pfizer or something yeah. like that. It's like, really? <laughs> it's that kind of crap yeah, that just yeah. destroys this country. And, and that's not representation. It's just no, not. no, no. I, you know, I, I, I wish there was a better system for electing, um, you know, when I'm out there campaigning or when I'm out there talking to my staff or whatever, they say to me, you know, oh, how much money have you raised? Because all, I know. you know, it's about money raising, money raising, money raising. If I didn't have to fundraise, I could literally get my hand in the hand of every voter, you know, but I'm spending so much time trying to, you know. Connect with different people to get more get money. Get your money. And let's face it, you, let's do the math. In the state of New Hampshire, we have 1.3 million people. That's people. It's not people who have money or, you know, we're talking, we want children in there mm -hmm. with everybody. 1.3 million-ish people. Mm -hmm. And if you divide that in half by CD1 and CD2, you're down to roughly, you know, 750,000 or so, right, people. Something like that. 650. Yeah, okay. And then you divide that in half by Democrats and Republicans. 325. Say, okay. And then, okay, so that's 325,000 people. Right. Okay, in my district alone, just Republicans, I have seven running in the race. So now you divide that by seven, 
What do you got? 50,000? 350 50,000. 50, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I, if I got $1 from every single person that was pretty much in my catchment area, I could raise $50,000. And they're telling me they want me to raise $3.2 million because that's what Ann Custer raises. <laughs> most, if not, well, at least most of which comes from out of state, right. without a doubt. So we did the math on mine. We, you know, we pulled it all up and I'm more than 50%, I'm over 60% of my contribu contributions, contributors, came from the state of New Hampshire. That's really so good. That's phenomenal. But, it's, but you're that's right. Huge. It's it's ridiculous that you have to raise that kind of money to get uh, get that job. Yeah, pay to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's it's just you know you spend so much time and then look at the term of Congress. It's two years. So you get in, you get your feet wet, you look at the new bills coming up this session, and then what? We're into year two. Oh, better start better start fundraising. Yep. Got to start campaigning. Spend more time in district. Right. Yeah. You know. And so I really feel like that that term should be longer. But less of them, you know, like it you should be a four year term for two terms, like our president or something like that. Something, yeah. Or a three year term where you're not just spending all your time fundraising. That's an interesting idea. <coughs> um, to extend that idea, as you know, that there are some that are big fans of the, of the notion of invoking Article 5. I'm not going to get into a big diatribe mm -hmm. about that. I happen to be a fan. That's okay. We can leave that to another day. Um, and then there's. Uh, you know, letting the states propose amendments to the Constitution if they're needed. You just mentioned one good idea about how we could tweak congressional terms. Um, the other option, of course, is Congress does it, and then mm -hmm. that and then that idea goes to the states and they vote on it, whether they right. like it or not, and, and that's how you do it. Um, how would you go about promoting an idea like that in Congress? Let's change the length of our terms to four years, and let's limit them. Mm -hmm. Um, would that be a, a priority? If, I think it would be a priority. You know, I, okay. I certainly, you know, I, if I've been asked the question, you know, what do you think of what new? What's the piece of new legislation you're going to bring? Mm -hmm. And I kind of laugh at that a little bit because we got a lot of laws. I don't necessarily need to go to Congress to make some new laws. I need to go to Congress to kind of fix what we got that's broken and yep. start working on what's going on. If I never institute, but that would I would be inclined if I were going to bring new legislation for it to be something like that. Hey, uh, we need to get Ricky on. We got Ricky on line one. Yes, we do. Let's bring Ricky on. Hi, Ricky, Rick. welcome to the show. Sorry about that. Okay. Welcome to the show, Ricky. Thanks for calling. Oh, you're welcome. Um, enjoy your show. Um, I think it's great that your guest is running for office. Mm -hmm. um, we really need to get um, the Democratic mindset out of New Hampshire politics. Um, I take it you, you guess is a Republican. Yep, that's correct. A few minutes ago, and uh, I think it's great. And um, I think we just need to uh, take a step back and actually see what um, Donald Trump is doing to this country. And I'm in favor of what he's doing. He's not perfect, but he's better than what we've had in a long, long time. So um, keep up the good work and, um, and uh, enjoy the show. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for calling, Rick. Um, yeah, one of the things that um, I don't know how you're going to orchestrate it, but when you go toe to toe with Annie Custer on a debate, it'd be really cool if people actually articulated issues, had the time to actually articulate an issue, like your Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Why do you? What would you do about it? And wh what? Why do you believe it? and things like that, like actually articulate ideas and argue over ideas instead of um, attacks, because that's all, it's all we're doing. I mean, because there, there's some really cool, like, I really wanted Ted Cruz and Bernie Sanders to win. The reason is I wanted that to happen because it would be really cool if you could have somebody who believes in socialism articulate why they believe in it, why it would be good for the United States, and somebody like Ted Cruz who could articulate why capitalism is is the the uh, the better way, mm -hmm. and really and have the debate or Rand Paul, I don't, I, it doesn't matter. But what I'm saying is that there's no debates on issues anymore. There's attacks on people now. Oh. Like you ran into that. We don't have much time. 
But you were out uh, kissing babies today. How many babies did you kiss? Oh, I knocked on a lot of doors today. Knocked on a lot of doors. Like shaking babies and kissing shaking, hands. Shake, no. Didn't kissing babies and shaking hands. <laughs> But anyway, so you did that a lot today. You were out there knocking on doors, and, and most people were pretty receptive. Oh, they were. I can't believe how many people hugged me, which I thought was so sweet. Um, you know, people are just so grateful that I think that we're finally getting some representation. Number one, they were grateful I came to their door. And number two, they, um, well, they were grateful for my service, which I am so proud of, and I'm just so honored to be able to wear a uniform. I absolutely consider it a privilege um but they were you know but <laughs> except for my one man <laughs> who you know his response was he wanted to stick a bullet in president trump's head and that's, yours that's so extreme you, you had one person <laughs> actually say that on the campaign trail today and they wanted to yeah that donald trump deserved to have a bullet stuck in his head and okay i i just i i can't the visceral response of the American people. Nobody deserves to die for being a public servant. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, I would never wish any person to get a bullet in their head for serving our nation. In whatever you know, that, that's what I mean. It's look, like look at what happened to, to Senator Paul. I just brought his name up. You know, a month or two ago, somebody tackled him in his front lawn while he was mowing the lawn. And or those, or those congressmen that were shot yeah. playing during baseball, baseball during the baseball game. Yeah, it's it's absurd. No, absolutely. And let me you know just say, if you've ever held the hand of a person who's been shot in the head, or somebody who's lost their legs, that nobody deserves that I, even our warriors and you know i mean obviously our warriors don't but um whether you're on the battlefield or whether you're in the emergency room at a civilian hospital that is the horrific just the visual of it i was so taken aback by that um that s somebody in new hampshire would feel that way I, I can understand if you disagree with the president, no doubt. That's what makes mm -hmm. America, America. And that's why I continue to wear a uniform. So every person in this country has a right to feel the way they do. But I don't think that that opens the door to threatening to kill our president or any other public servant. Right, no. <laughs> and yet, by contrast, the scores and scores of folks that you talk to. Oh, they hugged me. We're, we're, we're <laughs> literally <laughs> embracing. contrast, huh? Right, right, yeah. right, which made up for it. And I, I understand, you know, the person is frustrated. Um, but, oh, my goodness, we have, just like you said, we have got to get that mindset out of the people. Nobody deserves to die. What, what if I may ask, and this might be a touchy question, but what would you suggest the, the press at large might want to consider doing to help tamp down on that sort of vitriolic attitude? Well, number one, they need to tell the truth. <laughs> okay. That would be so, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Number one, I mean, the media, the media does tend to, and I'm sorry, I know you're a media, you know, we're on media right now, um, but you're not. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I mean, it's, <laughs> no, a, it's a fair question. But, um, you know, I think the media really spins this. You know, they tell partial truths. They put just a little bit of information out there. They don't put it all out there. And then it gets the reaction going. And uh, it, it, we don't need it. But... If it bleeds, it leads, and so you got to make it juicy so it'll get on the front page, or the papers aren't going to sell, or the, nobody's going to turn your station on, yeah. or whatever. So they're well, yeah, it it's like as, just as quick. We got to wrap this up, but it's just, just, been just an hour. Yeah, hun, See? yes, wow. yeah. The um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like this week of uh, President Trump just questioned whether or not uh, all he did really was he was asked, "Do you believe the Russians hacked the emails?" And all he's basically he's saying in his mind the jury's still out. The guy's gotten so much misinformation. I think he'd be it, an idiot for the jury not to be out. Mm -hmm. It would because have been unstatesmanlike for him to stand there on next to the president of another major country and and accuse him of of guilt. Lying. We, we, he would have to accuse him of lying. They, also, it, you know, they wanted him to go on record doing that. So it's yeah. kind of a gotcha question. So he he was statesmanlike in the way he, he actually handled it well. But the next n the next thing I don't agree with the guy a lot of the time. But I think that. But was for the whole next day, it was he was treasonous, and it's like. Wow, it's so like not even close. Hey, so we're running Lynn, low on Lynn, time. Lynn, Lynn, how can they get in touch with Lynn Blankenbecker? Oh, so my website is, or my my contact is Lynn L Y N N E, the number four N H, Lynn for N H, or they can try me at Blankenbecker dot com, B L A N K E N B E K E R. I'm on Facebook, Lynn Blankenbecker. You uh, 
we've got literature depots everywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, I look forward to folks reaching out to me. Um, thank you for the opportunity to to <laughs> chat with you this evening. It was my pleasure. Was my pl hey, so the first one was Lynn what? Lynn for NH. So Lynn, Lynn for NH. Yeah. It's a lot easier to spell than sure. Blankenberg. L-Y-N-N-E, the number four, N-H. Lynn, thank you for your service. Thank you for running. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in Congress. And Talk about being visit. qualified for Congress. I know, Don't you right? think, Carrie? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, thank thank you, you guys show. next week. Thank you. Take care.